Hello ladies and welcome. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the theories of forgetting. So we've been looking at memory um, and last week or last lesson we looked at forgetting and what that actually means. So remember that forgetting is not necessarily the fact that the information didn't go into long-term memory but more about the fact that we can't retrieve it from long-term memory. Okay. Um, Today we're going to be looking at the theories of why some psychologists think we cannot get information from our long-term memory. Okay, um, And you'll find out today sometimes it's due to the retrieval cues. You'll find out what that means in a minute. Sometimes it has to do with interference. Other times it has to do with sometimes we actually want to forget stuff. Okay. Um, luckily for us, we have a special guest in today to talk to us about some of this information. So I'll introduce to you... Aja. <laughs> you can wave if you want. Okay, so we're going to basically just be running a little class, uh, asking each other questions and stuff like that, and giving you some of the information. So, first theory we're looking at is the retrieval failure theory, and uh, I'm going to hand you over to Haja. Okay, so the retrieval failure theory. Now, this theory is based around the idea that our memories don't just disappear into thin air. <clears throat> the reason we can't remember things sometimes is because we don't have the correct cues to access that information. Right. Um, there are numerous um, factors that influence our inability to retrieve certain information, including, um, for example, sometimes we don't want to remember things because they, too painful. they're too painful or they bring a bad memory back. And at other times, it's because... Um, the material we want to remember has been replaced by other material, other more important material, and we just can't remember it. Um, and yeah. All right. Um, and the tip of the tongue phenomenon. Okay, so um, the idea of the tip of the tongue phenomenon is that you are aware of the information, you know what it is, but you just can't verbalise it. You, you can't access that information. Um, the reason for this is because you might not have the correct cues necessary to... Um, to access that information in your long-term memory. For example, Mr. McDonald's dog. You might know that the hit's name, her name, has two syllables, that it starts with J, but you just can't figure out what her name is because you don't have the correct cues to access it. Um, what else? That's about it, really, I think, for that. Interesting thing about the tip of the tongue phenomena is that it tells us that retrieval is not all or nothing we can partially retrieve information depending on the cues that we have. So an example that Haj used with trying to remember my dog's name, you would know if I said, is it, if someone said, is it Sally? You'd be like, no, it's not that. So you can tell sometimes what it's not because you have a partial retrieval. So if someone says, is the dog's name, I don't know, you know, um, Rumpelstiltskin, <laughs> you would say it doesn't have that many syllables. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so the most important thing about the tip of the tongue phenomena is that it tells us we don't just recall all or nothing. We can partially recall information. Thanks for that. The next theory is uh, kind of what Haja was talking about before with the, the idea of interference. So when we're looking, when we're thinking about the interference theory, it's as we as it's written up there. We forget because other memories interfere with what we are trying to recall. So, if which makes your class life or your school life difficult because you think about it. Every time you learn something, 75 minutes later, then you have to go and learn something else completely unrelated. Does that make sense? So, you know, if you go from psychology to global politics to maths, all that information that you're trying to retain in your long-term memory has all been jumbled up because you've got psychology stuff and then math stuff and global politics stuff. So there are two types of interference that we really need to know about and you can see them there. Retroactive interference which is where new information interferes with remembering old information and proactive interference which is where old information interferes with remembering new information. So for example if we were to learn, try and learn some new languages, okay? An example of retroactive interference would be if we learned Italian, period one, 
then we learned Spanish period two and then we had an Italian test period three okay the new information is interfering with the old information so that's retroactive okay new information interfering with old retroactive also if we were to go the other way around and we had a Spanish test period one sorry a Spanish class period one then we had an Italian class period two then we had an Italian test period three we would still have some level of interference okay and that's called proactive interference does that make sense? yeah I think so are there any questions? um no how do you think we could remember the difference between retroactive and proactive? So retro, as you said in one of your past videos, was something from the 70s. So you remember that it's in the past? Yes. So the information from the past is being interfered with. Yeah. Okay. Whereas proactive, the information from the most recent, the new information, is being interfered with. Does that make sense? So it's not what's doing the interfering. It's what's being interfered with. So retro is the old information is being interfered with. Hopefully that makes sense. Good work. Thanks. <laughs> okay, another theory. Motivated forgetting. Uh, this is an interesting area of psychology and to be brutally honest is slightly unreliable at, at the moment. The research has not completely... Um, proven this one way or the other just yet. So these are phenomena, these are things that people have um, reported happening. There is some research evidence that supports these theories, but there is still some evidence that disproves these theories. So basically motivated forgetting is we forget because we want to forget, because it's too upsetting or too disturbing to remember. So um, for example, um, people that return from war or people that have been in a traumatic car accident or have just recently had the death of a family member, something like that. There are some ways that people will forget or try very hard to forget parts of, if not all of those memories. Okay. So some people suggest that we re reconstruct the past to remember what we want to remember. There's a bit of information around that. Um, so the first type of motivated forgetting we're looking at here is repression. And this comes from Freud's theory. You may remember Freud from year 11. He was kind of a little bit crazy. Um, but a lot, of people still ref a lot of people still respect his theories. His idea of repression was is that people unconsciously block a memory from their awareness, like a protective factor. For example, there's a video, and I'll post it online, um, on the website that talks about a young lady who 20 years later after going to therapy remembered that her father killed one of her friends it's a crazy little story it only goes for a little bit but the idea was is that at the time when she saw her father murdering one of her friends that was such a traumatic event and she was so scared that if she told anybody her father would kill her, that she put that memory really, really deeply down in her long-term memory and put a whole bunch of blockers in front of that. So she couldn't remember that event. Okay, It wasn't until 20 years later when she went to um, therapy where she could then remember that event. Okay, Once again, there are issues with this. Um, there has been recent research that talks about how you can actually implant a memory into somebody through hypnosis or, or through certain therapies. And that's, that's a bit awkward because we don't know whether these memories are being brought up or being created on their way up. The last one is suppression. Slightly different and it's going to be tricky to understand the difference between these. But suppression is where we deliberately block a memory from awareness. So repression is we unconsciously block it so it's like our body or our brain protects us and it buries it in in our memory okay but suppression is where we have some sort of control over what we remember for example sometimes um, and the textbook will give you this definition sometimes when um, people 
lose a close family member, they will work lots and lots of hours, kind of consciously keeping their mind off the death of a family member. Okay, okay. for example, this might not apply to everybody, but sometimes if uh, people go to a party and they do something stupid at a party that they're not proud of, they might spend that rest of that week doing a whole bunch of things during the week like doing extra study or going exercising and not and kind of avoiding their friends that were at the party, doing a whole bunch of things so they don't actually have to think about the stupid thing they did at the party. Okay, That would be a form of suppression. That's where you're deliberately not paying attention to the memory that you've formed. And in some cases, people can actually um, change the memory. So, for example, if you did something stupid at a party, um, or you, even if you did something stupid at school, during the encoding process, you might change how big a deal it was. Does that make sense? So, you might start to, every time you remember it, you remember that, ah, oh, it wasn't that bad. You know, it wasn't, people didn't really care that much. Okay, and so when that happens, you will report that the memory is not that big a deal, like it's not as bad as you thought it was. But research tells us if we take someone who's done that and then we actually interview people that were at the event, they will report it to be a much bigger deal or much more um, dangerous. Is there any way of um, retrieving the original memory? Good question. Is there any way of retrieving the original memory? The research would say probably not. And this goes back to memory formation that we were talking about a couple of videos ago where um, you have types of when you are actually encoding the memory uh, and storing the memory when you the first time you bring that memory up um, you it's it can still be changed a little bit once you change it it's like overriding the file you can't go back to the original memory okay but that was a good question thanks the last theory is decay theory this one's a pretty simple one basically it's as it sounds it decays physically so this talks a bit more about the neural basis of memory. So remember we looked at the neural basis of memory. We're talking about how your neurons actually change and they, they make certain connections. This is a little bit like um, the example that I always give of the rubbish bins. Okay, so this basically says that because we make, it's almost a physical change when we create a memory, if we don't keep revisiting that memory, or if we don't keep revisiting the bin, basically, then the path to that memory decays. So either the grass grows over the pathway in the metaphor, or literally some of the um, dendrites and some of the axons will decay. Okay, we call that a, a, a chemical trace in the brain or a memory trace. Um, and if you don't revisit that memory, then it will start to fade. This is exactly like that. Um, graph that I gave you, remember the forgetting graph that I gave you at the start of year 11? The more you go back and revisit that information, the more likely it is to stay there. But if you don't revisit it, it decays and disappears. All right. So this is more about a physical decay rather than a hypothetical decay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, that's basically it for our forgetting theories. Uh, I want to thank Haja for being our special guest. Thank you and for asking some good questions. Um, and if you think that you're an expert on any of our upcoming um, topics, then you too can be a special guest panelist. Make sure you take some notes on these, and um, I will also upload some questions that are related to this that I want you guys to answer, but we'll do most of that stuff in class. So um, thanks again, and see you soon. Bye.